Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Will you stand and we'll start with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this morning and for your goodness to us over this last week. God, we're just so blessed again that we can gather as your people, Lord, that um, you've given us this space and this time to be together in this way. Holy Spirit, we just ask you now, we invite you once again to be in this room in this next hour, God, even throughout the whole day, Lord, but that you would dwell with us specifically now, that you would bring us understanding, that you would give us insight, that you would open to us the word of God. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to minister to our hearts on an individual level. God, come and give me what I need today, Lord, from this study in your word. God, come and give it to my brother, give it to my sister, to everyone that has an ear. God, let us hear what your spirit is saying to the church. Jesus, we thank you for this time now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, again, good morning. Um, we're coming back this week for a second lesson in this series on seasons of seeking. And last week, we um, just began by defining what it means to seek the Lord. And if you remember all of those phenomenal definitions in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, um, the concluding thought is that to seek God really um, means to have a heart posture that is towards him, that is for him, that's desiring him more than anything. And then there were several verses that we kind of landed with that talked about seeking the face of God. Do you all remember any of those things about seeking the face of God? Um, it's just throughout the scriptures where that that admonishment is given to seek God's face. Um, First Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Um, Psalms 24 and 6, David said, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. And again, Salah means to stop and pause and to think about what was just said, to think about this idea of seeking his face. Psalms 27 and 8, when you said, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And then Psalms 105.4, which says, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continuously or forevermore. So again, this idea of seeking the face of God, it's, it's um, you know, again, the face is, is an, an organ of intimacy. That's where we get to know a person and how we get to know a person. And it's not just that we would be after discovering or uncovering um, God's physical face, because if you did the homework, how many of y'all did the homework? A few hands, there you go, great. Um, in Exodus 33, where Moses is literally in this conversation with God and seeking his face, God told Moses, no man can see my face and live. It's too bright, it's too powerful, it's, there's too much light and glory and holiness. It would consume you. Um, so it's not necessarily his physical face, everyone, but it's the fact that the face means his presence. It means his personage. It means I want to know you intimately. And God, as much of you as I can take in, and as I can get to know, if I can, can get to know you like Moses, because remember, it was said of him that, that um, Moses was a man that God talked to like a man would to his friend, okay, face to face, that they had a very intimate relationship. And much of that um, was a result of Moses' intent pursuit of God, right? 40 days on top of a mountain, just him and the Lord. It comes down. The people still don't got it right. So what does Moses do? He didn't quit and run off the scene. He didn't say, I'm just done. I'm giving up ministry. I can't do this. He went back up the mountain. Okay. He went back a second time to be in the presence of God and get to know God. Um, so again, we're seeking his face. We, we want to know him. And then remember all of those um, faculties of the face, those organs of the face, the eyes, the nose, the ears, um, the mouth even, that, that although they all have specific functions, that really it all ties back into the personality, the heart, and the mind of a person. So when, when David says, and these other psalmists throughout the book of Psalms of seeking God's face, they're saying we need to get to know who he is as a person. We need to know him personally. We need to find him. We need to know his heart and what is his mind on this matter, that matter, and the other matter. 
okay, because God means for us to know him. So I want to kind of focus in this morning on just one aspect um, or avenue in which we can seek God so that we can know God, and this is specifically through his word, okay, seeking God through the avenue of his word. Um, Remember, on the face, you have the mouth, and the mouth is that organ of communication. It's where we get words from people. Um, A lot of times you will know what's on a person's mind and in their heart based on the words that they speak to you. And even what's interesting is sometimes uh, someone can say some words, but the tone with which those words are delivered will communicate a totally different thing. Okay. And so there's this aspect of us seeking God and finding him through his word. Unless you all fall asleep and check out real quick, because this is Sunday school, this is not just another lesson on reading your Bible. Tell your neighbor this morning, so it's not just about reading your Bible. Come on, because we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. If you have this aversion to reading, then whenever you come to church and the preacher or Sunday school teacher says, you need to read your Bible, y'all yawn, right? Because you don't want to read. Um, and you just, we can, if, again, if we're not careful, we can just tune things out. And so don't tune it out this morning because I think there's something in it for you. This is not just another lesson about reading your Bible. I'm going to give you all two points very quickly here. Hopefully these will inspire you. Um, Hebrews 4 and 12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Okay. What does this verse mean to us this morning? This is what I think this verse means, is that if I were to um, lay out on my dining room table a puppy, pick your favorite type of dog in puppy form, and we'll put it on the dining room table, Um, a miniature rose bush, okay, in a a plant holder, so I got uh, a baby dog, got a puppy, uh, rose bush on the table, Then let's add to it, um, just, uh, we'll keep it in baby form, a baby tiger, okay? So puppy, rosebush, baby tiger, all right? Everybody with me? And then let's take a stick of dynamite and light it so that it's a lit stick of dynamite, okay? Y'all still with me? Half of y'all's like, I just left the house right there, okay? So we have a puppy, a rosebush, a baby tiger, a stick of dynamite, and then at the end of the table, we will set the Bible, the word of God. What this verse has just said to us in Hebrews 4 is that God's word is more alive and powerful than anything else on the table. And listen, because that is true, everyone, not because I'm just making up a fun analogy, but because it is the truth of God's word, then I need to constantly and continuously attend to God's word because I want the word of God to do for me everything that any of those other living things could do. That puppy could bring me enjoyment and happiness, companionship even. The rose bush could be a thing of beauty when it blooms. That dynamite certainly will tear some stuff up. And that tiger, when it gets big enough, could be scary. All right. Also could be really cool to have a pet tiger. All right. The word of God, it trumps all of those things. Okay. It actually says in the scriptures, I think it's in John, that the word at one point became flesh and it dwelt among us. Do you all know who that was or what that was? That was Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior was the very words of God become incarnate. And so everything that we, we would ever think about or, or try to find when we go to seek God in his word, it's really what we're after is Jesus, everybody. That there was one theologian that said it like this, is that you can find or see the face of Jesus Christ on every page of the Bible. And listen, if you have read a page and you don't see him, you don't understand it, you don't find it, guess what we should do? Go back and read it again because he's there. Go back and search again because he's there. 
And that's part of this idea of seeking God in his word is I'm not just trying to do a religious exercise. I'm not just reading the Bible so I can check it off my um, Christian um, uh, task list for the day. That's not what I'm doing. I'm looking for somebody. I'm trying to get to know someone. I want to understand more about this person of Jesus Christ. And the word of God is a primary way in which I can seek to do that. Second inspirational thought I want to give you this morning comes from James 1, um, starting in verse 18. You don't have to turn there, but just listen carefully. It says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, okay? Meaning we got saved because we heard the word. At some point, we had to all hear the word. We had to hear the gospel. It did something in our hearts, and we responded to this truth, okay? Um, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, quick to keep listening, because you heard it and you got saved. So he says, that's how you got into this thing, and that's how you will walk out this life is if you will keep listening, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That means to get angry. But be, verse 22 says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Here's the, the thought I want to leave you all with from this particular passage is that the word of God, when we come to it, everyone, it has the ability to transform us and change us. It does that. But God's, the Bible is not magic. Tell your neighbor, this is not a magic book. Come on, it's not a magic book. Just because you have it and you read it doesn't mean poof, everything is gone or poof, you all of a sudden are living right. Um, he's very clear here that we have a responsibility with some actions that should dictate our response. One, that we are continuously hearing the word. That I'm quick to listen to what God's word says. Not quick to come up with what I think it says. Y'all know people make up verses all the time. That really ain't in the Bible at all, okay? Especially preachers. <laughs> we can make up some stuff. That's not actually what it says. I need to be quick to actually hear it and to make sure that what I'm hearing and possibly even what I'm saying is actually what the Bible said and what it means, okay? And then he says this idea of us becoming a doer of the word, meaning that I can't just hear that I need to love my enemies, I can hear that all day long and do nothing with it. it listen, it doesn't count if you don't do it. it. It does not count if we don't live it, okay? What God is desiring is that when his people seek to know him through his word, that somehow that word begins to get inside of us and we become these living epistles is what Paul said. We begin to live this thing. It's not just I'm saying it or I'm hearing it, but I'm actually living it. I love my enemies. My heart becomes broken for that person that's against me. And all of a sudden, the truth of God's word, I love this phraseology, it jumps up off the page and it lives through me. So then when people look, they say, oh, wait a second, look at that group of Christians over there. They love their enemies. And once again, the word becomes flesh because we've allowed Jesus to live in us in that way. He said in this same passage in, in verse 25, he gives us several um, um, action words here that all relate to seeking. He says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, meaning I'm, I'm going to dig into this thing and I'm trying to find something. And then again, continueth therein. That I, I just didn't look once, I don't see it, I couldn't see Jesus' face, I'm done. And you move on to the Quran, or you move on to some Buddhist writing, or you move on to your own way of living, your own interpretation. No, it says you got to continue in it. Come back to it, everyone. Continuously put your face in the book. 
Because that's where you'll find him. That's where you'll see him. God's word works also as a mirror, okay, which means it is a continual place of revelation where the Holy Spirit empowers us for living. How many of you all looked in the mirror this morning? Okay, several hands. Good, good. I'm happy we all looked in the mirror. You know, oftentimes this, this passage in James, you, you hear a lot of people um, use this with reference to the word of God. And it's sometimes a lot of what I heard has been this negative connotation that you go to the word and it's going to show you everything that's rotten in your life. You know, um, how, how encouraging is that? <laughs> it's not very right. Okay. But it is true. It will. But again, this idea of it being a mirror, you know, uh, most of us, when we got up and, and planned to come to church, we had intentions of, of looking our best. Okay, we wanted to have every hair in place for those of us that have hair. We wanted, you know, gentlemen with ties, we wanted these ties to be straight. And, and you, you know, we got in front of the mirror and we combed our hair and we sucked it in and tucked it in and, and you know, did all of these things in front of the mirror because the mirror was revealing of us. And not just the bad stuff, but the good things. We use that as a place of beautification and preparation when we get in front of the mirror. If you, gentlemen, if you go to shave, you know, some of y'all might have the ability, you know, the curvature of your face and you can do it without looking. But does it help to have a mirror? You don't mess up as much when you have a mirror. You don't cut up as much when you have a mirror. You don't, you don't end up with a point of casualty when you have that mirror to go to. And again, it's not just that I looked in the mirror 25 years ago and saw, yep, I look good, I'm fine, and never came back to one. No, I come there every day because there's something I need to work on every single day. There's something that I want to get right again. I had it right yesterday, but I want to get this tie tied right. So again, I come to the mirror again where I can see it. And self-correct. So, so God's word, again, it is a mirror, this continual place of revelation where I can see myself. But you know what? It's not just me that I want to see because the Bible says that I'm being fashioned into the image of Jesus Christ. So when I come to God's word as a mirror, not only can I see myself, but I also can begin to see Jesus. And church, this is important. I can see Jesus in me when I come to God's word. I could begin to recognize based on what the scripture is saying. You know what, God? Yeah, I really am loving my neighbor as I love myself. I see it in this situation. God, I really am loving my wife like Jesus, you love the church. Oh, I see how you did that. God, I'm I'm also endeavoring to do that. I see this happening in my life. Yes, God, I'm not provoking my children to wrath because what? I see it in your word and I'm I'm catching this in my own life, okay? It becomes a reflection, not just of the bad, everyone, but of the good, okay? Encourage your neighbor this morning, would you say, get in the mirror and see the good. Come on, get in the mirror and see the good, all right? And listen, we're going to still have that little self-correction often. Right, you just ate a whole bunch of chicken and ribs and, and meat and was tearing it like a, like a rabid dog. Yeah, go get in the mirror and get the meat out your teeth. Come on, fix that up, all right? Don't put, ladies, don't put your lipstick on in the dark. No, we don't want it way over here. Come on, do it right. Get in the mirror. So we still can get in the mirror for self-correction, but there is good that is happening, amen? Okay, so keep those two inspirational thoughts in the back of your mind. I have just a few points this morning about seeking God through his word. And this first point is very similar to that last inspirational thought, but I just want to say this, to seek God through his word is to come to the altar of constant fellowship. Okay, come to the altar of constant fellowship. When we open up the Bible, everyone, and when we set before the word of God, And I'm going to talk about heart posture in this next point. But when we set rightly before the word of God, it is a place of continual communion with God in heaven if we would embrace it. We have this constantly throughout the scripture. In the Old Testament, when they put together the the, um, 
the tabernacle, and then later they had the temple. God actually instructed them to have a table or an altar off to the side in the tabernacle, which was called the table of showbread. And they were to bake um, special bread and, and season it with special spices and to let it sit there in the presence of God, where God was literally filling that place with his presence. And it was a symbol to the people that God would always give them the provision that they needed. Now, the provision was not just a physical provision, but it really was the spiritual provision of his word. And that's why Jesus later says in the New Testament, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so when I come to the Bible, when I open up the book, all right, when I begin to pursue God through the scriptures, it's an opportunity for me to step into this place of constant fellowship. See, his word is already anointed. His word doesn't need the right key um, to get everybody going and right. As soon as you open the book, there's access if you want it. Okay? As, as soon as you come to the scriptures, that it even says that a fool cannot err therein. Okay? There, there is, listen, there is no excuse for a hungry heart that wants to find and know God to not find him in the book. You can't get lost in it. I remember... Um, Right after I got saved, um, I was struggling for just a, just a very small bit, like a few days, less than a week, with this idea of Bible reading because of what I had experienced previously before I was saved for real. Someone reminded me of that phrase the other day. Okay, so before I was saved for real, I used to read the Bible, uh, but that was just because people told me to. How many of y'all have ever done, read the Bible because somebody told you to? Okay. But you didn't do it because you really wanted to or understood why you needed to. Um, so I was just, and I remember reading it beforehand. And, and first of all, I had the nastiest looking Bible in the world. It was a dollar store Bible. I don't know if any of y'all ever had a dollar store Bible. They get the smallest print on the cheapest paper with the ugliest binding. And that's the, you could hardly even open it. Okay. And so I had this Bible that I can't hardly even crank open. And you know, I was a young person at the time. I didn't need glasses, but I had to squint to see the words. Just the experience in and of itself was not enjoyable, okay, in trying to physically handle this book. And I remember being told, yeah, you all need to read a proverb a day because there's wisdom there. I will stand by that now that I have the Holy Spirit to help me. Um, but I would go to Proverbs, and I would just read. I would pass all the words through my eyes and get to the end of the chapter, and I had no idea what just happened, Okay. That's not what we're talking about this morning. That's not seeking God. That's, that's completing a religious exercise, okay? Let's not be religious in our pursuit of God because we'll deceive ourselves and we won't find him, all right? So, so I, when, I, when I got saved for real and realized that, you know what? I have messed up a whole bunch of brain cells with, with pre-salvation activity, and uh, I don't remember enjoying this to begin with. I began to prime my soul, everybody, by something very simple. I said, Holy Spirit, would you help me? Because I really don't know. Would you help me to understand what I'm about to read? Would you help me, God, really to find and to know you? All right, I've had all these people for years telling me I need to read the Bible, and I'm finally at a point where I want to, but Lord, I don't want this to be an exercise in futility. God, would you please help me? And listen, I was desperate in that prayer asking God to help me find him in his word. And do y'all know what happened? He helped me. This, listen, this had nothing to do with natural ability or intellect or reading level. I'm telling y'all, I was dumb as a box of rocks. I hadn't been to Bible college yet. I had not been to college. I, I had actually just failed the first quarter of high school, straight Fs. So I, I was not the, the most you know, intellectual or astute person, but I was hungry for him. And that's all that it took was a hungry heart and a cry out to God, Lord, please help me to find you in this. And you know what he did? He began to help me. And I began to find him. And I, listen, I fell in love with Jesus and his word. Could I just say that again? That, listen, that's where I learned to love him, was in his word. 
Listen, I, we had great church services and the worship was phenomenal, but I didn't fall in love with him because of a song. I fell in love with him because of his word. And then when I got to church and they might happen to sing a song and I would begin to discover, wait, those lyrics, that matches what's in the word. Yes, I can get with that song. Because I already had something implanted in my heart because of that altar, the altar. So the, the word of God, we seek God through his word. It, it's coming to this altar of constant fellowship. So I would encourage you, if you're a new believer or if you've you know, been saved for a while and maybe have just struggled with finding God in this place of his word, I, I, I challenge you, I encourage you to just pray that prayer. Make it your own. God, I want to find you in this book. Let this really become a living word to me. Let this be bigger and more exciting than the tiger on the table. Let it be more powerful in my life than a, than a, a stick of lit dynamite, Jesus, because you are the word of God. It actually says in the book of Revelations that one of Jesus' names is the word of God. Okay? So we, we want him to, again, come up off the pages and Jesus live with me, talk with me. In Hebrews 13, G, um, the, the writer's actually quoting um, the words of Christ. He says, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Okay, listen, church, if you have the word of God on the inside of you, that verse makes sense. That passage works. If the living word is living in me, then no, he's never going to leave me or forsake me. Because even when I might not feel like it on the outside, externally, there's a living witness and truth on the inside of me. Amen? He also said in, in Matthew 6, 11 and Luke 11 and 3, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, so there's an opportunity every single day. And I heard one preacher say this, and I just love the phrase. He says, listen, the word just said we should pray to God and say, give us this day our daily bread. It does not dictate how thick the slice is. So however thick you want it is how thick you can have it. All right? Y'all, Some of y'all just want the little thin slice, okay? You get your little two verses in a day, and you call it good, all right? If that's what you're living on, some people want a whole chapter, a longer passage. The, the, the thickness you get to determine, but there's fresh bread for us every single day. And then Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So again, as I come to the Bible, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for Jesus. I want to find him. I want to know him. I want to be changed by him. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25, it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever so again this constant place of fellowship that is incorruptible what does that mean corruptible means that it's prone to die that that i might have something and it looks nice now but eventually it's going to die because it's corruptible incorruption means that it has this eternal longevity that it cannot be soiled it cannot be tainted it cannot be destroyed Okay, and it actually says that, that God's word in 1 Peter 1, just going down to verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Okay, it endures forever. And so that's why, again, as Christians, as believers, uh, uh, lots of the things that we do in life and the way that we live, the way that we structure relationships, the, the way that we interact with people, the way that we run our businesses, we want to found all of those things on the word of God. We want to be biblical. We want to be um, rooted in God's word. Why? Because his word endures forever. It will stand and has stood the test of time. So again, this incorruptible seed started me off, and now I need to stay in this. Here's a second thought this morning, everyone, is to seek God through his word requires a hungry and a receptive heart posture talked a little bit about heart posture last week that seeking God again it's this matter of the heart my heart is in it okay that I, I, I am sincerely longing for God with the depth of my being 
right? But my heart has to be in this, everyone. And, and here's, here's a, a very clear picture they give us in the scripture of maybe how our hearts can be like this. This is in 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3. Listen carefully. He says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Okay? So desire the sincere milk of the word as a newborn baby would. Now, if, if, if you all have not really interacted much with newborn babies, you might miss an important truth that's here. But when a newborn comes into the world, like I'm talking within 30 seconds of that child being born, it is ready to receive nourishment, okay? And depending on the birth scenario, a lot of times that's the first thing that they do. They don't even clean the, the little kids off anymore. You know kids are kind of dirty when they first come in um, to the world. They don't even clean them off sometimes. They might, you know, give them a quick wipe down. They still need to be bathed real good, but they'll immediately take that baby and bring it to the mother so that she can nurse that child. Okay. And that child does not really come out of the womb unless there's something wrong, it's sick or, you know, something, ex um, you know, external to this. Um, the child does not argue with the mother. The child does not say, no, I really would prefer chocolate milk and you just serving white milk today. I, I want to die at Pepsi. No. The, no, no child comes out the womb talking, I would prefer steak, don't give me milk. <laughs> no. The baby comes on, comes, comes, and it immediately latches on and begins to receive the nourishment that has been prepared for him or her. Okay? And, that, and they actually tell us in, in the research that, that there's this, this element um, within the mother's milk. Honey, it's a C word. What is that word? Colostrum. There you go. Oh, all these farmers with the cows. <laughs> I heard more colostrum from over here. Colostrum, okay. It's colostrum. And colostrum has within it these nutrients that a newborn baby needs, okay, that it, that it was designed to need. The colostrum will help protect it from infection. The colostrum will kind of kickstart its digestive system because it's starting to eat for the first time. The colostrum will come and, and help it to begin to grow and, and does all of these different things because of the hormones and the chemicals within it that causes this child to grow and to develop as it should. And so it keeps coming back again and again and again to get this mother's milk. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the milk, the, uh, the production, it only has colostrum for a, a, a high percentage of it, you know, a special potency of it for the first few hours or days that this child has come into the world. Okay? And so when he says we should, like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, he's saying be just like that newborn baby and run to God's word. Latch on to God's word. Allow it to come inside of you and produce in you things that you don't even know that need to be produced because you're infantile. Come and desire it. Thirst for it. You know, we, we notice, my wife and I have five children, we notice in, in those nursing years that, that because they became so connected to mother that even if she held them and they were hungry, they thought it was time to eat. It didn't matter if you was in the middle of the grocery store, if you were sitting in the middle of a church service, if you just picked up this child from daycare, this child would begin to seek out the milk source. And oftentimes my wife would say, listen, someone else need to hold this baby because they about to go crazy in their pursuit of mother's milk. I wonder if, if we would desire God's word like that. If we would, when we get in his presence, if it's just like, God, I know you have something to say to me and I want to hear it through your word. God, I know there's some nutrient. <laughs> I'm laughing because this lady told us a story. In some countries, you know, they nurse their children at, at different, to different stages and ages. In the U.S., most U.S. moms is like, listen, I'm done at, at a year. Some people go a year and a half. I heard this one lady who was still nursing this kid at five years old. Okay. <laughs> I could make a lot of comments. I'm just going to laugh because it's, so, it's like he was nursing and he had a cookie in the other hand. 
That was too much. But what would it be, guys, if we were constantly in pursuit of what God had for us through his word? You know, one of his Old Testament names is El Shaddai, which means, watch this, it means in the Hebrew, the many-breasted one. The one who is all-sufficient. The one that I can run to and should run to for any and every provision. We, we have to, listen, we have to have a hungry heart like a newborn babe to seek God in his word. And then going right along with this, the next point is to seek God through his word is to eat the word. I want to change my vernacular from here on out. I don't just want to say I'm going to go read my Bible. I'm going to go eat my Bible. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, don't just read it. You need to eat it. Okay, what, what, why am I saying this? Why do we need to eat it and not just read it? Because again, if we're not careful, we can be religious with our reading. We just pass it through our eyes. And we can think, oh, I checked that off and I'm walking out the door and I did it and God is happy. He's like, you, you didn't get none of that. that. No, we did not connect. Christ was not formed in you in that little setting that you just had where you pass words through your eyes. To eat the word, okay, I want you to think about this, like that newborn babe, when, when the baby gets that milk, or when I begin to eat something, it, listen, it becomes a part of me, all right? Do you understand that's why your, your britches, the size has increased, because all them donuts have become a part of you, all right? Do you, let's, no, seriously, it works both ways. Do you understand why your dress size has shrunk? Because all that celery has become a part of you. When we consume something, it becomes a part of us. All right? They even, when we go to Tanzania, they have us take um, this malaria medicine. And we actually have to start taking it, I think, a week before we go. Um, so that it can get into our system and our bodies begin to build up this immunity. So that when we get over there, should we get bitten by a mosquito that has malaria, that you already got something working on your behalf. Why? Because it's in you. It's already in your bloodstream. It's already in your body. It's already working. Well, on one particular trip, my wife had done some research, and she says, you know, um, they say that garlic is good as well. And so about two weeks before the trip, if you will start to more heavily introduce garlic into your, your diet and you eat that, then the garlic becomes a part of you. So much so that when you perspire, the mosquitoes would sense the garlic and leave you alone. Why? Because I ate it and it became a part of me. The same thing is true with God's word, church. If we will not just read it, but eat it, it becomes a part of us. And, and listen, half the stuff that we're trying to fight with people about doing, we don't have to fight with them anymore. Why? Because they already got it in God's word and it became a part of them. Okay, so listen, all of my convictions about dating and opposite relationships, I'm going to just be real honest with y'all. I didn't have a handbook to tell me what to do. I had God's word. And something got on the inside of me, and it changed what was perspiring, what was coming out of me. God's word did that. Not rules, not regulations. The word of God. That's, listen, that stick of dynamite got in my soul and blew up all the wrong ideas and all the wrong notions. And I began to have a conviction that was based on God's word in the life of the Holy Spirit. Okay, how I was going to handle my finances, what I thought about the church, what I thought about where I was going to live and how I was going to raise my children. So all, listen, all of those things came because God's word gets on the inside and it, it does its transforming work. In Jeremiah 15, 16, the prophet said, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. It didn't give him indigestion, everybody. It didn't give him heartburn, but it caused his heart to rejoice for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. In Psalms 34 and 8, it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Blessed is the person that would get in the book, read the book, eat the book, and then believe what it says and trust God. Blessed is the man. And also, the, this, when we get this word inside of us, it transforms us. It changes us. We, we, listen, we begin to look different. Something happens on the outside. And even in our minds, 
because of this word of God. It says that, that this word in the New Testament, there's this washing of the water by the word. That it cleanses us. You, you listen, you got some mind troubles, some mind issues, whatever they might be. Struggling with thoughts from the past, struggling with lustful thoughts, struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety. Okay, listen, all those things are real, everybody. And this is not a pat answer for every single person in the midst of a struggle. But I will give you this as a word of God answer is that the word of God is a remedy. Seeking God through his word, pursuing him through his word, being transformed and changed, washed by the word of God when we take it in is a reality. It actually says this in Romans 12, that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do our minds get renewed? Through the word of God. Through the word of God. If we will allow our hearts, particularly through our eye gates and our ear gates, to be impacted by the word of God, we'll be transformed. We, listen, we will be transformed. To seek God through his word requires meditation, okay? It requires meditation. And and, um, again, in this society that we have today, um, most of the meditation that's done is new age or um, some off religious practice. A lot of times Christians have lost this art of meditation because we're caught up in the pace of the culture. Meditation requires time, okay? Will you just educate your neighbor this morning? Say, meditation requires time. You say, what is meditation? So, um, in Psalms 1914, David says this, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Meditation is this idea of taking a thought specifically related to God's word, taking a truth that's related to God's word, and I allow it to marinate, if you would, in my soul. I allow it to ruminate, okay? I allow it to just kind of sit and settle until everything that's in it has been leached out into me, okay? They actually use um, a word. I'm going to try this over here. Uh, One of the Hebrew meanings for the word, it means to resonate. Okay, so here you have a piano. Did you all hear that? Okay, so that's just real quick. I just, I hit the word real quick like that. I heard it. It might have sounded lovely. I'm done. And I move on. That's not meditation. But that's how a lot of us do with our daily devotions and Bible reading. It's a, all right, and then three days later, and then a week later. All right, just real quick, we we hit it, we're done, and we feel like we've done our duty. But when he said this, you should meditate. God, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight. I'm going to try to make this work with this pedal. You have this pedal down here that when the keyboardist will hit it, you hear how that is sustained. And you can hear the echo of that tonality for just a little bit. It becomes that resonance in the backdrop, okay? That, listen, that is what should happen with the word of God. Is that there becomes this resonance in our soul. And long after my finger has left the key, or I've even walked away from the keyboard, I can still feel and sense the resonance in my ears. If it's strong enough and powerful enough, the sound, the tonality, okay, you can, it kind of makes it rumble and shake you. That's what happens or should happen when we meditate on the word of God. He said, I'm going to find a scripture, I'm going to find some biblical truth, Lord, and I'm just going to allow this to kind of rumble in my soul until I feel it 
till I can hear it. Okay, a lot of times meditation, practically speaking, you, you learn to meditate as you sometimes um, try to memorize a scripture. Okay, you commit it to memory. You want to get to the point where you can quote it for yourself. Where you, where you, and then it's not even just I want to be able to spit out the words to this verse, but God, I want the meaning of this piece of, of your word to take root inside of me. Okay, he said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Here's another key point to meditation is the words of your mouth, meaning I have to say this myself, okay? You, I'm giving you all Christian biblical permission to talk to yourself. Tell your neighbor, say, you need to talk to yourself, okay? But don't talk crazy. Talk the word of God. Get in front of that mirror in the morning and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on, deal with anxiety and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. You, you begin to take these scriptures and I don't just memorize them so that I have this repertoire of scriptures that I memorize. But all of a sudden, I have this resonance in my soul that the Holy Spirit is able to hit the key on at any moment. And a chord is struck within me. This is, again, church, this is seeking God through his word. Hand in hand with this, we'll step into this next week, is when I have this in my soul, this, this word that is resonating and marinating inside of me, then the Holy Spirit is able to constantly reach in and to pull it up and to help me to apply it in my life. And one of the most practical ways that he wants to use his word with application in our lives is in prayer. And that is another avenue through which we can seek God. And we'll discuss that next week. Amen. Will you all stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you again this morning for your word. God, truly that um, it is life. God, it is, it is the life giving agent. Jesus, you are the living word. And God, I just pray even now over this congregation and over this church, Lord, that you would stir in us a hunger and a thirst for more of you and your word, because you promise in your word that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. God, you said that your word is also a, a sword, God, that it's the sword of the spirit, God. And if we would learn to abide in it, Lord, then we would be that much more equipped for the battle at hand. God, we just give you the remainder of this day. We ask that you would be in our midst, that you would be in our worship. God, that you would be in the preaching of your word that is to come. God, continue to speak to our hearts and transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.